دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقاء وكن رجلا على السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ما بعد uh, We were still doing uh, the book of Kitab al-Da'awat of Imam al-Bukhari sahih and we were, had not yet finished the chapter number 10, what du'as to make when one wakes up in the middle of the night. And we had done the first hadith, which is the hadith of light. We now move on to the next hadith, which is similar to that, and it is another du'a that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would uh, pray when he woke up in the middle of the night before he did Salat al-Tahajjud. And the hadith goes as follows, قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ ibn Muhammadin قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا سُفْيَانِ قال سمعت سليمان بن أبي مسلم عن طاووس عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قام من الليل يتهجد قال اللهم لك الحمد أنت نور السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد أنت قيم السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد أنت الحق ووعدك حق وقولك حق ولقاؤك حق والجنة حق والنار حق والساعة حق والنبيون حق ومحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم حق اللهم لك أسلمت وعليك توكلت وبك آمنت وإليك أنبت وبك خاصمت وإليك حاكمت فاغفر لي ما قدمت وما أخرت وما أسررت وما أعلنت أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت أو لا إله غيرك This beautiful narration from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma says that whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would wake up in the middle of the uh, night to do tahajjud, he would make this uh, dua. He would make this dua. And the, um, uh, the previous hadith is also from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, and this hadith is also from Ibn Abbas, and therefore he is memorizing different ad'iyas, different du'as that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say in the middle of the night. And this one, O oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. You are the light of the heavens and earth and all that is in them. And to you belongs all praise. You are the qayyim, and the qayyim is the one who controls. The qayyim is the one who is the qayyum. The qayyim is the one who makes sure that everything is running in order. You are the qayyim of the samawati and the ard and all that is in between them. وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ To you belongs all praise. أَنْتَ الْحَقِّ You are the truth, O Allah. There is no truth greater than you. You are the decider of truth. Truth comes from you. You utter nothing but the truth. You are the arbiter of truth in every sense of the meaning of haqq. Allah Azza wa Jal is al-haqq. And that is why of the 99 names of Allah is the name al-haqq. إِنَّ اللَّهُ هُوَ الْحَقِّ Allah is the one who is al-haqq. وَوَعْدُكَ حق. Your promises are true, O Allah. And the promises here imply anything that Allah has promised will occur. Most importantly, the promise of Judgment Day, and the promise of justice, and the promise of punishment for the tyrants and zalimeen, and the promise of rewards for those who are righteous. So your promise is true. Your speech is true. Nothing that you utter Allah except that it is the truth. And as Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا Who speaks more truth? Who speaks more truthfully than Allah? No one speaks more truthfully than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the meeting with you is true. And the meeting is, of course, every one of us will be meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And the Jannah is true, and the Nar is true, and the day of judgment is true. Now, why are we going over this list? Why is this in the dua? When we're supposed to be asking something, why are we making this a statement of fact that, oh Allah, you are true, heaven is true, hell is true, the prophets are true, the books are true. Why do we go over this? Number of reasons. First and foremost, as a testimony of our own faith that, oh Allah, I believe in all of these things. Secondly, to reaffirm it within ourselves. In other words, it's one thing to just say it, and then by saying it, we then affirm it in our own lives. And we remind ourselves of this reality. And we, inshaAllah ta'ala, will then begin to act upon that reality. So by saying this statement, we are affirming it to be true, and then we are reinforcing its truth within us. And then the third reason we utter these factual statements is then to get to the point of the dua, or the second half, I should say, not the point, but the second half of the dua, the first half is 
that we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second half, we ask Allah for what we want. And we learn from this is that before we ask Allah what we want, we preface that asking by praising Allah the way that He deserves to be praised. We don't just jump and say, oh Allah, give me this. No, we raise our hands and we begin by praising. We begin by affirming the truth. We begin by tahmeed and tasbih. We begin by clarifying that, oh Allah, you are the one who is, uh, who, who is worship. We are the ones who are worshiping you. And when we utter these phrases, we do so with humility. And that humility then precludes what we're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this whole list, so you are true, you, the meaning of you are true, is true, heaven is true, hell is true, the day of judgment is true, the prophets are true, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is true. Then you mention, based upon all of those truths, what have I done, O oh Allah? I don't just believe in them. O oh Allah, I have submitted to you. Aslaka aslam to oh Allah. And by the way, this is such a powerful dua. It really is one that we should go over word by word. Its phrasings are so poetic that they move the soul. They're so eloquent that you cannot help but get into the spirit of this dua. And you now confess to Allah that based upon what I believe, I am now moving on and my actions affirm what I believe. O oh Allah, to you I submit. O oh Allah, alayka tawakkalt, my trust is in you, O oh Allah. Bika amantu, I believe in you, O oh Allah. Ilayka anabtu, I turn to you, O oh Allah. Bika khasamtu, I argue because of you, O oh Allah. Meaning if somebody rejects Islam, somebody rejects the Day of Judgment, that is when I will argue. I will not argue for my ego. I will I will uh, argue on your behalf, O oh Allah, to try to prove the truth. Wa ilayka hakamtu, to you I judge, O oh Allah, something is right something is wrong, something is ethical, something is unethical. How do I know? You are the one, O oh Allah, who I turn to for judgment. Now, based upon all of this, and what a beautiful dua, you've affirmed the truth, and now you've shown Allah that you've acted upon the truth. This is the essence of precluding to a dua. What do you do before you ask Allah what you want? You begin by praising Allah. You begin by affirming that you have acted upon that belief. And then you say, oh Allah, based on all of this, now what do I want from you? Faghfirli. Forgive me, O oh Allah. The whole dua revolves around this issue of asking forgiveness. But we ask it after we praise Allah and after we affirm what we ourselves have done. So, O oh Allah, based upon all of this, forgive me. However, it's not just forgiveness and it's not just a simple forgive me. Even in our petition and plea, there is a very, very eloquent methodology for doing so. And this is one of the uh, etiquettes of dua, that when we ask Allah, we don't just ask and then that's it. We ask in a manner that demonstrates how much we need. We ask by reiteration. We ask by repeating the same thing and by reaffirming the concept with different wordings. So it's, فَغْفِرْلِي, forgive me. But then what? فَغْفِرْلِي مَا قَدَّمْتُ وَمَا أَخَّرْتُ What I have done and what I have yet to do. And what I have hidden and what I have done publicly. Now, you could have just said, oh Allah, forgive me. But there is a point of, of, of thoroughness. There's a point of pleading. There's a point of begging. Oh Allah, I want every sin that I've ever done, the small and the large, the big and the this, the hidden and the unhidden, the past and the present. You are affirming because you want to demonstrate to Allah how much you want to be forgiven. So all of this is an affirmation that I want to be forgiven, oh Allah. That which I've done secretly, that which I've done in public, that which I've done in the past, that which I've done in the future. And in other narrations as well, in other uh, du'as, that oh Allah forgive the large and the big, the public and the secret, uh, the, the past and the present. Uh, oh Allah forgive the, the one that's done intentionally, the one that's done unintentionally. So you have a whole long list of adjectives about the types of sins. And if you said, oh Allah forgive me all my sins, you're including all of this and that is a valid dua and that is found in other uh, uh, duas as well. But right here, our Prophet ﷺ is describing various categories of sins to be fully thorough. And then he ends by praising Allah, أَنْتَ الْمُقَدِّمُ وَأَنْتَ الْمُؤَخِّرُ O oh Allah, you are the one who brings some people high or forward and you are the one who debases and lowers and brings other people in the back. Meaning what? تُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ Allah is the one who can confer izza and honor. Allah is the one who can raise the ranks and Allah is the one who can lower the ranks if a person deserves that as well. So Allah is al-muqaddim and al-muakhir 
And this means, muqaddim here means to bring up forward. Muqaddim here means you're in the long line and Allah has the right to pick somebody and push him forward because of a mercy, a blessing, because of something that the person has done. Allah has that right. وَأَنْتَ muakhir, And Allah can take somebody back if they deserve that as well. And so by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and concluding this dua in this manner, we are once again affirming that, oh Allah, we, uh, we believe in your power, your ultimate power, and we want to be brought forward. We want to be pushed up, oh Allah, la ilaha in, la ant, la ilaha ghayruk, that there is no deity worthy of worship besides you. So this is another beautiful dua that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say when he woke up in the middle of the uh, night. And this is before tahajjud. We move on to the next chapter now. Uh, chapter number 11 in my edition, Babu Takbiri wa Tasbihi Inda Al Manam. The chapter regarding saying takbir and tasbih when one goes to uh, sleep. So before going to sleep, you should do some adhkar. So what is this hadith? قال حدثنا سليمان بن حرب قال حدثنا شعبة عن الحكم بن أبي uh, ابن أبي ليلى عن علي أن فاطمة رضي الله عنهما شكت ما تلقى في يدها من الرحى فأتت نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم تسأله خادمة فلم تجده فذكر فذكرت ذلك لعائشة فلما جاء أخبرته قال فجاءنا وقد أخذنا مضاجعنا فذهبت أقوم فقال مكانك فجلس بيننا حتى وجدت برد قدميه على صدري فقال ألا أدلكما على ما هو خير لكما من خادم؟ إذا آويتما إلى فراشكما أو أخذتما مضاجعكما فكبر أربعا وثلاثين وسبح ثلاثا وثلاثين واحمد ثلاثا وثلاثين فهذا خير لكما من خادم This is a very beautiful hadith from Ali radiallahu an from Fatima his wife and that is the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this hadith is so moving that we really should think long and hard about the reality of this hadith. Fatima complained of the fact that her hands had become coarse because she had to uh, grind the mill in order to cook the food, in order to uh, uh, take the barley out and then cook the bread from that. So Fatima, uh, her hands had grown coarse because of all of this grinding, because of using the millet, because of the manual labor that she had to do uh, in the service of basically being a, a wife and taking care of the household affairs. And so she decided to uh, ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a servant. And in one narration, it was her husband Ali radiallahu an who said to Fatima that, Oh Fatima, you know, I feel so bad. Now obviously Ali is doing his work, he's do out in the fields, he's doing his business and trading. And then he comes and he sees his wife uh, toiling and, and tired and there is, uh, you know, there's, there's marks and whatnot. And in fact, uh, in one version of the hadith or in other narrations, that I should say, that uh, because of the rope that she was using and putting it on her back when she would go to the water well that there was a mark on her back as well and because of her sitting down and, and uh, uh, rubbing the, the millet of the, the, the barley that there were marks as well on her chest and so Ali radiallahu an felt sorry for Fatima and he said to Fatima that look you know your father uh, he is going to get so much wealth from Bahrain from other places you know the wealth is going to come why don't you ask him to from that wealth get you a, a slave get you a servant why don't you get somebody to help you uh, in this regard and so the, the, and, and by the way, the, the house of Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhu was a little bit far away. They had a house in the area of Medina called Al Awali, and it is a, around a 30 to 40 minute walk from uh, the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So she came all the way back into the town. And she entered or she asked permission to come in and the Prophet was not there, Aisha was there. And she waited, he didn't come. And so Aisha says, well, what, what, what did you come for? So she told Aisha the reason why she came. And she then returned back. The Prophet was busy in some uh, errand or some visiting. We do not know where he was. He was not there that day. And so she returned back home before it became nightfall. And when the Prophet came, Aisha explained to him, oh, you know, Fatima came and she told me such and such. By the way, this also shows us, you know, this uh, 
version of history that some uh, groups have that there was major tension between Aisha and Fatima radiallahu anhuma that they did not get along etc etc this is clearly very much not true it is highly exaggerated uh, look at this narration here that Fatima and Aisha radiallahu anhuma are conversing she's asking her need Aisha then conveys it without any issues to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam this is uh, a later uh, addition that people have or some groups have that there was tensions between the Sahaba to the level of you know boycotting and whatnot this is simply not true Aisha and Fatima radiallahu anhuma they got along fine and they're having conversations and uh, and, and whatnot so Aisha conveys this message to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the two of them Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhuma had gone to sleep it's late at night they've gone to sleep they're lying down next thing you know they hear a knock on the door and who is coming at this time of the night? It's the same night that she came. The Prophet ﷺ, as a mercy and as a tenderness, it's his own daughter. He feels her pain. And the same night he walks all the way to their house. And that's like a half hour, 40 minute in the minimum. And he goes all the way there. And he finds the two of them. So uh, Ali radiallahu an uh, opened the, the, the door. Fatima was, was lying down. And of course, Ali uh, asked the Prophet to come in. And Fatima wanted to get up out of respect for her father. And the Prophet said, lie there, don't worry, lie there. And you know, in those days, it's something difficult for us to imagine. Their houses were very, very small. They in fact typically had one room with a small little cabinet or closet or a pantry for stuff that they would hold. So they had one room. That room was where they ate and where they drank, where they slept, where they had visitors. Everything was in that one room. There was no space. That was the way it was. They didn't have the wealth that we do, that this is living room, this is dining room, this is our study, this is whatnot. You know, subhanAllah, sometimes the, the the, the restrooms that we have in our modern houses, it is bigger than the original houses of Medina that the people used to live in because subhanAllah, wealth has, has, has changed us. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered the house and there is no place to sit except on the very bed that Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhuma are sleeping on. That's the only place that they have. And of course, Ali is like a son to him. He raised Ali like a child, remember. And Fatima is of course his daughter. And he doesn't have any, uh, this is his own daughter. So he sits down and it was a cold night. It was a very freezing night. And I have lived in Medina for 10 years. I will tell you, it is very cold in the winters. And the Prophet Sallallahu was cold and he put his feet in inside the blanket and Fatima said I could feel the coldness of his feet even on my chest even though there was a blanket or something separating them but he put his feet inside and it was so cold that Fatima can feel the the, the coldness of the feet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he sat down and he said I heard that you came for such and such a reason should I not tell you something that will be better for you than a servant. SubhanAllah, his heart was in pain that his daughter needed some help. And he could not sleep that night until he goes to his daughter's house and he takes care of it. But how did he take care of it? And this is really so powerful. Those of us, those of us that have children, we know how we would feel if our children had to do this type of hard manual labor. And we know if we had wealth, we would make sure that they are taken care of in that manner. But you see, our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is a different level than any one of us. And his maqam is something we can only look at and admire. And his purity and the purity of his income and how he would spend it is something that is exactly why he is the Khatim al-Anbiya and Mursaleen. No one can compete with this level of Iman and Taqwa. And he said to them that, look, you want something of this world. What if I tell you something that will be much better for you than a servant of this world. I will tell you something that if you do it, it will be a treasure that is far more precious than a servant who will clean and cook and do the dishes and whatnot. I will tell you something that will be a genuine treasure that will benefit you in this world and the next world. When you go to bed, when you lie down, then say the takbir 40, uh, three times and say the tasbih 33 times and say the tahmeed 33 times. So, so subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, you say it 33, 33, 34 to get a total of 100 times. Before you go to sleep, do this dhikr 100 times, 33 times the tahmeed, 33 times the tasbih and 34 times the takbir. Say this and that will be better for you than a servant. And then he said, now this is not in this version, but it is mentioned in other versions uh, of the hadith. And again, remember I told you this many times that 
we compile all of the narrations to form the full picture. Imam al-Bukhari, at times the, uh, he doesn't bring the entire narration for various reasons. At times it's not authentic to his level, so we go to the other books as well. At times he's looking for a particular phrase, so he's not interested in the full narration. But we learn from the other narrations that he explained, he explained something to his own daughter. And he said, Wallahi, I cannot give you a servant for your needs, when the stomachs of uh, the people in the Sufa, in the Ahl al-Sufa are growling because of hunger and I have not fed them. In other words, there are people that are poor and they don't even have food to eat. And the, there was a group of people called the Ahl al-Sufa. And the Ahl al-Sufa were a group of companions that were so poor, they had nowhere to live except in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And they had no source of income, generally speaking, except if there was some manual labor to be done. And the main reason for them being there was to be in the company of the Prophet ﷺ for as much as possible. Abu Huraira was the leader of the Ahl al-Sufa. Abu Huraira demonstrates who are the Ahl al-Sufa. They were the people who wanted to dedicate their lives to be next to the Prophet ﷺ at the expense of a worldly income, at the expense of a career and a job. So they would just sleep in the masjid and be with the Prophet ﷺ as much as possible. And the Muhajirun and the Ansar, whenever they had a surplus of food, they would bring it to the masjid and they would give it to the people of the Sufa to eat. And so the Prophet ﷺ explains to Aisha, uh, sorry, to Fatima, and he says, Wallahi, I cannot give you a servant when the people of the Sufa, their stomach is empty and they don't have food, subhanAllah. And you know, this narration, he didn't go the next day and publicize it in front of all of the Sahaba. When one of us does a good deed, we take a picture of a selfie, put it on Facebook. Oh, I fed the poor today. Oh, I give this day. That's what we do. That's our standard and philosophy. Our Prophet Sallallahu he sacrificed not his own pain, of course he did that, the pain of his daughter. And that is the ultimate sacrifice. Every father knows this. To see your daughter in pain, to see your daughter having to manual labor for, I mean, obviously it's a noble thing, he's doing it for her family and husband, but still, he has wealth in his pocket metaphorically. If he wanted to, he could have assigned a servant to Fatima and no one would have ever said anything until the Day of Judgment. It is him, it is his daughter, it is Ali ibn Abi Talib, who would have said anything if he had given a servant to them? Nobody would have said anything. But you see, this is why he is Khatam al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. He is saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how can I spend money for a servant for you? When you have food, you have a house, you have a roof over your head, and you are doing some manual labor. There are people that have none of these things. And how can I give my family a servant when they don't even have food to eat? And therefore he said, look, this is better for you. This also shows us another thing, that even if you have to say no to somebody, he had to say no to Fatima, he had to say no. Even if you have to say no, there is a way to say it that actually feels as if you said yes and given them a gift. So he visited them in their house, he could have waited and he, she would have come back the next day. But the fact that he visited them, how do you think they felt? How do you think they felt knowing that the same day he walked from his house all the way to their house, the honor that he gave Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhum just for this going all the way back to their house, sitting with them uh, and comforting them and then saying, you know what, I'm gonna gift you something that is better than a servant. And he gifted them an act and a good deed that will be better for them than a servant. And then then even when he said no, he explained why he said no in a manner that they could not say anything. So look how much we learn from this hadith. Not just, don't, don't, don't just jump on the issue of uh, the, the adhkar, that's good, you do that. Yes, definitely do that. Make sure you do the adhkar. So from now on, by the way, and again, the purpose of all of these lectures, dear Muslims, is that we change our own habits. I want every one of us, before we go to sleep, if you used to go to sleep at 10.30 p.m., go to sleep at 10.20 and do all of these adhkar that we're gonna go over. Do the takbir, the it is better for you than a servant, subhanAllah. Better than a full-time servant. If you can just do this, it'll be more precious for you than having a servant. And the purpose therefore is we act upon this. Also it is narrated that Ali radiallahu anhu, when he narrated this hadith, when he narrated this hadith, he said to his student that I never left doing these adhkar 
ever since I heard the Prophet say so. Now he, he narrated this hadith when he was the Khalifa. And one of his students said that, O oh, Amir al muminin O oh, Ali radiallahu anhu, not even on the night of the Battle of Safin, the Battle of Safin was one of the most traumatic and one of the most difficult episodes in all of our early Islamic history. It was a civil war that we uh, are commanded by the Sahaba to not think too deeply about and we simply pass on and move on and we don't, uh, and we don't uh, say anything bad about the people involved. It was a very big tragedy where tens of thousands of Muslims lost their lives between uh, two uh, camps of the Muslim uh, uh, Ummah and Ali radiallahu anhu was on one side of it. And they went to sleep that night. Somebody, so later on the person is asking Ali radiallahu anhu, you are telling me that you have done this dhikr every single night since the Prophet taught you that? And Ali said every single night. The man said, even the night of the battle of Safin, and Ali radiallahu anhu was quiet for a while. Then he said, you have asked me an awkward question, but I will tell you, yes, even on the night of the battle of Safin. He never ever stopped this habit until he died. And this, my dear Muslims, is the sign of true piety. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the best of all deeds to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are those that are consistent, even if they're very small. You know, I want you after this lecture is over, or even if you want to pause right now after, after I ask you to do this, I want you to sit down one day with the timer, with your cell phone or with your watch, and click it on, and start doing tasbih and takmir and tahmid and do 33, 33, 34. And before you do that, ask yourself a question, how long do you think it's going to take me to do this? Do it properly. Don't do it super fast and don't do it super slow. Do it the way that it should be done. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. So you're not going to go, no, do you have to go subhanallah and go super slow. Do it at a normal rate and ask yourself, how long do you think it's going to take? then actually do it. And then I guarantee you, you will be surprised at the answer. Then ask yourself, once you actually, I'm not gonna tell you anything more, once you actually figure out how long it, it will take you, then ask yourself, why would I not do this every single night to get the rewards that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked us to do. So this is one of the adhkar that Imam al-Bukhari is teaching us in his book, that before you go to sleep, make sure you do these adhkar. We move on to the next chapter. What else should we do before going to sleep? Chapter number 12. Babu at-ta'awwudhi wal qira'ati inda al-manam. The chapter of at-ta'awwudh. At-ta'awwudh here, seeking refuge in Allah. And how do we seek refuge? Al-qira'a inda al-manam. That going to sleep uh, while reading the Quran, what should we recite to seek Allah's protection? So in this chapter, Imam al-Bukhari is going to tell us what we should recite before going to sleep. And the hadith, the famous hadith, قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ يُوسُفِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا اللَّيْثِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنِي عُقَيْلٌ عَنِ بْنِ شِهَابٍ قَالَ أَخْبَرَنِي عُرْوَةُ عَنْ عَائِشَةِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَانَ إِذَا أَخَذَ مَضْجَعَهُ نَفَثَ فِي يَدَيْهِ وَقَرَأَ بِالْمُعَوِّذَاتِ وَمَسَحَ بِهِمَا جَسَدَهُ So this hadith, Aisha radiallahu anha says, whenever the Prophet would lie down to go to sleep, he would nafath, he would blow into his hands. Now, nafath, nafath is to blow with the sound of a spit without actually spitting. Okay, there is no English word for it. Nafath is to blow that sounds like a spit, but there is no saliva that comes. So, that is nafath. No actual saliva comes. It's not the goal. The goal is not an actual spit. The goal is this, the breath that comes out. And this nafath, he would do it into his, the palms of his hands. And while the palms were still there, so he's lying down, the palms are in front of him, he goes, like this, and then and in other versions we say three times, in this one it only does not, it does not say three times, but in other versions it's three times, then he would recite the Mu'awwidat. What are the Mu'awwidat? The Mu'awwidat are Surah Al-Ikhlas. In this uh, version we learn uh, that, uh, so, uh, in another version, excuse me, we learn the Mu'awwidat are Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, and Surah Al-Nas, three surahs. He would recite Ikhlas, Falaq, and Nas. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَحَدْ قُلْ يَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ He would recite these three surahs and he would recite them. And again, 
In this version it says only once, in the other version of Sahih Muslim it says three times. He would do this three times. So he would blow into his hands, recite these uh, surahs three times, and then he would wipe the body symbolically. He would wipe the body. That this is the barakah of the recitation of the Quran to protect me at night. And uh, another version says he would wipe it as far as his hands go down. He would not get up and touch his feet. No, no need to do that. But lying down, on your back, you just go over until it, you can reach as low as your hands go, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. And he would do this three times before going to sleep. And the goal here is that you protect yourself from shaitan, and you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any harm coming to you. So this is yet another thing that we can add to our routine before going to sleep. The next chapter, chapter number 13, Bab, and this chapter does not have a chapter heading. And it is very common in Sahih Bukhari that when he wants to switch slightly, but it's the same topic, he just says Bab, a new chapter. And he doesn't really give you a name because there's nothing new, but he wants you to know this is another uh, narration or another version that you can uh, also benefit from in this topic or this concept of what do you do when you go lie down at night. قال حدثنا أحمد بن يونس قال حدثنا زهير قال حدثنا عبد الله بن عمر قال حدثنا سعيد بن أبي سعيد المقبري عن أبيه عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا آوى أحدكم إلى فراشه فلينفض فراشه بداخلة إزاره فإنه لا يدري ما خلفه عليه ثم يقول باسمك ربي وضعت جنبي وبك أرفعه إن أمسكت نفسي فارحمها وإن أرسلتها فاحفظها بما تحفظ به عبادك الصالح بما تحفظ به عبادك الصالحون. So this is another dua that a prophet would say and also there is something that he's asking us to do if our situation calls for it. And of course, the situation in our times for most of us would not necessarily call for this. But the point is that the people of Medina, they're living in a desert environment and they have to constantly worry about predators or predatorial animals. And in particular, the two most obnoxious things that they would worry about are snakes and scorpions. Snakes and scorpions were fairly common, especially scorpions, they were fairly common uh, in Medina. And the Prophet is instructing us even issues of this world to protect us. And this is something that he himself mentions in a hadith in Abu Dawood, uh, that he said that uh, my position with regards to the rest of you is like that of a father teaching his children. I'm teaching you what is you need to know. So he would teach us things of this world that are also necessary for us to, to know. As the uh, And remember, a lot of the early Muslims, especially those that are coming from outside the city, they are coming from uh, many cultures or subcultures in which we would consider to be uncivilized. They haven't learned manners. They haven't learned adab. And so our Prophet is teaching them civilization. He's teaching them manners, what to do, even in matters of this dunya. And of course, this issue of uh, what, of course, the, the translation you have it on your screen, that when one of you goes to, to, uh, to your bed, then uh, make sure that you dust the inner part of your blanket with your undergarment, the izar, the undergarment is like the, uh, the robe that the people would wrap around, right? So this uh, under, uh, the, the underclothing, if you like. So remember, you know what people wear for ihram, the two garments that they wear for ihram? Realize that was the default clothes for most of the poor people. And to wear a shirt, the thobe, was actually a sign of middle class or you know lower middle class to upper middle class. That was the, the garment of the middle class of society. If you didn't have money, you would wear the two garments up and down. And in fact, when it was cold, you would wear the up and down garment and then put a thaw on top of it. So this lower garment that uh, uh, the Prophet is talking about, it is like a cloth that you just, loin cloth, you just roll it around your lower part and then you take another and you put it on top of your upper part and that was the standard garb of the poor folks and the majority of Sahaba would wear that. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that when you're gonna go to your bed and of course your bed has been lying there all day and there's a blanket on top of it, right? There's something there. You do not know when you've gone what has gone and stuck under that blanket, whether it's a scorpion, whether it's a snake. And here this hadith shows us that taking precautions and acting in a wise manner is a part of Iman. Iman isn't just you jump in and say, tawakkal ala Allah. No, before you get to bed in a society and a land where there's scorpions, you make sure there are no scorpions. And obviously in the lands that we live in, and most of us, I would say, we don't have to worry about any type of scorpion, any type of bug. So therefore this type of, of, of 
of advice is not as binding as it was back then. And even back then, this is something that is sunnah or mustahab uh, to do. So he is telling us when you go to your, 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 your bed, then make sure that you use your inner garment and you use the side of it that is facing you. So uh, you're going to take your garment, you're going to fold it backward, and then you're going to just dust. You're going to dust the uh, the the the, the uh, sheet, or you're going to dust the blanket to make sure there's nothing over there. Now, why did he say use the inner part of your garment? Some of our scholars say it's something that is um, ta'abudi or something that we don't know the reason. We just do it. And other scholars said no, it's pretty obvious why. And that is that when you're going to dust it, it will get dust on the garment, and you don't want to have dust on the outer side of your garment. So you, you imagine you're wearing this lower garment. What he is saying is you fold it back such that the side that is facing your thigh or your shin is now on the outside. Then you take that and you just use that to brush against the, uh, the, uh, the, the sand or brush against the uh, blanket that is there. The point being when you're going to do that, it will get a little bit dusty. When it gets dusty, you don't want that dust to be on the outside to show that it was dusted. And this also shows us another point of our sharia, which is that the sharia aims for us to look dignified within the confines of the sharia. We're not expected to look disheveled, unkempt, dirty. No, we're expected to look dignified and neat and clean within the confines of the sharia. So this hadith is another hadith about what we should do. And also the dua over here, Bismika Rabbi wa da'atu jambi, in your name, O oh Allah, I am lying down. In your name, O oh Allah, I'm putting my side on the ground. And in your name, O oh Allah, I'm going to get up with this as well. We begin everything with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you take my soul, O oh Allah, then be merciful with my soul. And if you send it back, O oh Allah, then send it back with your protection and the protection that you give to your righteous servants. Okay, so this is a simple dua. And by the way, if you cannot memorize the Arabic, it is no problem if you say these duas in the English language, uh, if you do not memorize them in Arabic, the concept is very clear that, O oh Allah, in your name I'm lying down and in, in your name I'm going to stand up. O oh Allah, if you take my soul, then take it with mercy. And if you send it back, O oh Allah, then send it back with protection. And then what type of protection? The protection that you give to your righteous servants. This also shows us another point, and that is that it is permissible to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is called conditional du'as, what is called conditional du'as. And conditional du'as are that you are asking Allah with a clause or a condition. You're asking Allah and you're linking it with something else. And this hadith is a clear example of this, where the Prophet sallallahu is saying that you say, oh Allah, grant me the protection that you give to your righteous servants. You don't mention what that protection is, but you're saying, oh Allah, the amount of protection you give to the righteous, I want to have that amount as well. And this is something that we learn in other du'as as well, that oh Allah, uh, yani whatever good you decree, then give me the good that you have given to the best of your creation, to the ibadik al-salihun, and avert away the evil that you have averted away from, uh, uh, from uh, the chosen of your creation. So we're allowed what is called to make ta'liq, or make a condition, or link it to something else, and this is something that is permitted in the sharia. Now, uh, the issue as we said of uh, the commandment to cleanse the bed. As I explained that the vast majority of our ulama, they understand these commandments to be commandments that are dependent upon the circumstance. This isn't a religious advice per se, it is the advice of wisdom that is meant for protection of our worldly uh, dunya affairs. And therefore, when there is no need for this to be done, then there is no, there is no need for us to actually do it. In other words, the advice to clean the blanket is not the same as the advice to recite the uh, last three surahs of the Quran. Because the first advice is something about this world. And this world's advice, we look at it. Do we need it? Do we not need it? If we don't need it, no big deal. We don't do it. As for the second advice, it is a spiritual advice. And that is the advice that our Prophet Sallallahu came to give us as a Nabi and a Rasul. We move on to the uh, next chapter, uh, chapter number 14. Bab al-Dua'i Nisf al-Layl the chapter of making dua in the middle of the night. 
قال حدثنا عبد العزيز بن عبد الله قال حدثنا مالك عن ابن شهاب عن ابي عبد الله الاغر وابي سلمة بن عبد الرحمن عن ابي هريره رضي الله عنه ان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يتنزل ربنا تبارك وتعالى كل ليلة الى سماء الدنيا حين يبقى ثلث الليل الاخر فيقول من يدعوني فاستجيب له من يسالني فاعطيه من يستغفرني فاغفر له this hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, it is one of those hadith that is, uh, that is mutawatir or has been narrated by many companions. In fact, uh, a number of early scholars have written treatises about uh, this narration of Nuzul al-Rabb or the coming down of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more than 20 sahaba, more than 20 sahaba narrated the concept of this hadith and this shows us that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say this to many, many different Sahaba in many different wordings to get the point across. And what is the point? That we prioritize praying at the middle of the night or towards the last third of the night. That we should be encouraged to pray Qiyamul Layl and to wake up when everybody is asleep. And the blessings of Qiyamul Layl and the blessings of Tahajjud are too many to list right now. Uh, but of those blessings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَلُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفٌ وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنٍ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That Allah is describing those who they, their sides are fighting their beds and they get up to pray in the middle of the night. They're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, only Allah knows the rewards they're going to get. And Allah describes the believers, that they would sleep little uh, at night. They would be tahajjud in night. They would seek Allah's forgiveness in the middle of the night. So, so many verses in the Quran, Allah is linking His maghfirah and the describing of the righteous with the night prayer. And uh, in the very first revelations that are given to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says to, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, نصفه أو انقص منه قليلا أو زد عليه ورط القرآن ترتيلا Spend the night in prayer. All of the night spent in prayer. Then Allah says, no, not all of it, half of it. Or a little bit more than this, or a little bit less than this. So the Prophet is commanded by Allah to spend a good amount of time in prayer. Night prayer. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ And during the night, then pray your tahajjud. And because of that, Allah is saying, perhaps Allah will lift you up and resurrect you upon the Maqam al-Mahmud. So Allah links the Maqam al-Mahmud to the nightly prayer. And our Prophet wasallam said that the nightly prayer, he said, I advise you to pray the night prayer, the Qiyamul Layl, because it is the custom of the righteous before you. And it is something that forgives the sins and it is something that raises the ranks and in one hadith, he said that the highest levels of Jannah, other people will look at that level and they're going to be jealous at that level. They are meant, as he was asked, who are they meant for? He said they are meant for those who pray when everybody is asleep. So, so many hadith talk about praying in the last uh, part of the night. So Imam al-Bukhari, when he's talking about sleep, sleep, sleep and going to sleep, he's saying, look, also make sure that you don't just uh, neglect this no notion of Qiyamul Layl. Try your best to pray uh, as much as possible. And my advice to myself and all of you is, if we cannot pray every single night, at least every once in a while, let us wake up and pray Tahajjud. At least in Ramadan for sure, let us pray Tahajjud. At least throughout the rest of the year, every few days, every few weeks, every few months, we should try to wake up and pray Salat Tahajjud. And this uh, notion of uh, praying in the, in the last or the night, it is also one of the most important reason uh, to pray is to make dua. This whole chapter is dua and Imam al-Bukhari is telling us, if you want your dua to be answered, then pray in the last third or the last half of the night. You want your dua to be answered, not every time is the same as other times. Not every time frame is equivalent to other time frames. Yes, it is true. Allah created all times, but sometimes are more blessed than other timings. And 
those timings are blessed because Allah has made them blessed and because those who are eager will do research and find out those timings and then come to Allah in those timings and then ask Allah for what they want. Some of our scholars of the past said, if you really want something from Allah and yet you are not waking up in the last third of the night to ask Allah for that thing, this shows that you really don't want it that much because you cannot even sacrifice your sleep to get it. So the one who can sacrifice his or her sleep and the one who can get up in the last third of the night and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they want, that is the one who truly desires that object that they're making dua uh, for. And this hadith is very, very clear. Our Lord Himself, yatanazzalu or yanzilu and other versions, our Lord comes down. Now, this notion of Allah Azza wa Jal coming down, I've explained this in other lectures, but in a nutshell, we don't think too deeply about this. We are not obliged to understand how. We simply believe and we affirm, as Allah says, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we understand that Allah is free from and above the limitations of time and space, and therefore, we do not, a'udhu billah, posit Allah within a three-dimensional uh, system. We do not posit Allah within our time frame. So if somebody were to say, how can Allah come down in the last third of the night in one area when it is day in the other, and then it will be one third in the other area and day in the other, how can Allah do this? We say, asking how is something that we are not obliged to do and our minds will not understand. Our minds will not understand how. We leave this reality to Allah and we say, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing like Allah and Allah hears and Allah sees. Just like Allah saying He hears and He sees. And we know the meaning of hearing. We know the meaning of seeing. And we don't ask how. Similarly, we know the meaning of Allah will come down, but we don't know how. And a man came to Imam Malik and asked a similar question that how has Allah risen over the throne? And Imam Malik became angry and he said, Allah is rising over the throne. This is something that is mentioned in the Quran. We must believe in it. And we understand the meaning of the phrase. But, so we believe in it and it's obligatory to believe. And we, uh, we believe in what the Prophet ﷺ said in this regard, and we believe in what the Qur'an has said, but we don't understand how. And we are not obliged to ask how. In fact, asking about how and trying to tr understand how, this is a deviation. This is not going to happen. Our minds are not going to uh, comprehend it. So Allah comes down in the last third of the night. We leave it at that. And we don't think more deeply about that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed ala kulli shay'in uh, qadir. We'll do one more chapter inshallah ta'ala and then uh, conclude for uh, today. Uh, the next chapter we're going to do, chapter number 15 in my edition, Babu ad duai Inda al the chapter of the dua when one uses the restroom. Now, Imam al-Bukhari is going chronologically that when you're going to sleep at night, he went through all of the duas of going to sleep. Now, typically when you wake up, the first thing you have to do, your bladder is full, you have to empty your bladder. So Imam al-Bukhari is now teaching you the dua when you're gonna enter the restroom. Babu du'ai inda al-khala. Khala is the Arabic word for restroom, when the bathroom we call it in English, that when you're gonna enter the bathroom. And in those days, uh, generally speaking, they, they had what we call a chamber pot that they would use uh, for uh, urination. And then uh, if they wanted to uh, do more than this, they would go to a place outside the city. They did not have built restrooms. This would only come in the next generation when people began to build when the money came in. Otherwise, they lived a very primitive life in Mecca and in uh, Medina. So in either case, even if it's a chamber pot or even if it is a land that you're going to go to and you're going to go behind a tree or a shrub, in either case, you will say this dua when you get to that place where you will relieve yourself. And in our case, the, the area is very clearly marked as the bathroom that everybody knows what it is. So when you enter this restroom, what do you say? The hadith is very clear. قال حدثنا محمد بن عرعرة قال حدثنا شعبة عن عبد العزيز بن صهيب عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل الخلاء قال اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الخبوث والخبائث أنس بن مالك says whenever the Prophet ﷺ entered the khala. And as I explained, khala is any area you're going to relieve yourself in. So when you enter that area, you say, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from al-khubuth wal-khaba'ith. And this is the uh, more correct version of the hadith with the ba has a dhamma, al-khubuth wal-khaba'ith. Al-khubuth wal-khaba'ith. And this means I seek refuge in you from 
the male and the female evil jinns. That's the, 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 the more correct version. There's another version which is also correct, but it is not as strong as this one. And that is a silent, uh, silence on the ba, al-khubthi wal khaba'ith. In which case, khubth means I seek refuge in you from all types of filth. And khaba'ith would be the evil jinnis. So both versions are correct, but uh, the khubth and khaba'ith makes more sense over here. And the point here is that when you're gonna go to the uh, restroom, you are uh, going to firstly uh, uh, expose yourself. And that's an area or a place where the shayateen, they, uh, they love to see these awrat. And so we say Allah's name before we take our uh, garments off. And then secondly, the shayateen, they love evil and filth. And so they are typically found in places of evil and filth. And physical filth and spiritual filth are the places of the shayateen. So where fahisha takes place, is where the shayateen will go. Where there's gonna be instruments of shaitan or the drinking issues of shaitan or the dens of vice of shaitan, that is where the shayateen are going to be. And also where there is physical filth, so actual places of the restrooms and whatnot, where there is the najasa from the human body, so the shayateen that are evil, not the Muslim ones because there are Muslim jinns. We're talking about the evil jinns. The evil jinns are shayateen. There are Muslim jinns. The Muslim jinns are pure. The Muslim jinns don't live over there. But the evil jinns, they love to be impure and they love impurity so they are concentrated in abandoned places. That is why this notion of graveyards being quote unquote haunted or whatnot or abandoned, there's an element of truth in that the jinns love to be there because people don't want to be there. So the jinns love to go there. And also the jinns love to go in the days before there were restrooms and toilets, the jinns love to go to the actual physical filth, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, astaghfirullah, they love that. And so they go over there and they uh, congregate over there. So when we go there, we seek Allah's protection and refuge and we say, oh Allah, protect me from those evil uh, entities. Allahumma ni'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. So this is a simple dua that I know many of us teach our children and we should make sure that we ourselves memorize it. And of course, even though the, the restrooms of today are not, you know, uh, that type of filth that, uh, that um, uh, used to be, but still, relatively speaking, uh, if there are evil shayateen, and we hope inshallah they're not in our houses, if they are, that is the place they will go to in any way because that is where they like to be. And we seek refuge in them from harming us and from doing anything to us. So we say this before we enter the restroom. And inshallah with that, we come to the conclusion of uh, today's uh, halaqa. And inshallah we will continue uh, ta'ala after the month of uh, Ramadan. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال